Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 303. And yes, I'm keeping this angle because I went to the dermatologist uh, the other day, and being a uh, Florida born and raised person and of my skin complexion, uh, my annual uh, visit to dermatology is what they internally call Cancun Team Week Funding Day. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I got to get smarter about investing. I should pre invest in liquid uh, nitrogen uh, prior to my visit because I will get a bump in, I'd be like insider trading, I'll get a bump in my value of investment knowing that their demand is going to go up or, uh, uh, substantially the day I go to the dermatologist. So yes, pardon the, the band-aid on the face, but the doctor says, oh, let's take care of that. And I'm like, whoa, thank you. That was my face. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mr. Dean, how are you today, sir? Hey, we're doing good. It's Friday. It's Friday. It's the Friday before Memorial Day, a little bit long, right. and nicely of the first real optimistic large holiday. I, I don't know what, what how to character phrase it, but obviously the discussions we've been having about this holiday in particular um, have been uh, optimistic because travel's up 600% in flights, uh, 38 million people are going to be driving. Um, yeah. Just and a lot, and, and yeah. not just to stand at a distance looking through a window, but genuinely showing up without masks and or uh, other things, and uh, spending time for the first time with family. I think I hope we don't lose track of what the holiday's for, but I think everyone's happy that we right. have a holiday. Well, and I think, and you know, we as as a culture in the United States, as as a people, we we kind of mistakenly had this idea last year at Memorial Day. That hey, this was the we're at a point now where you know what I've had it. I'm just going to go out. And you saw right. a big rush Memorial Day last year. Uh, we know in hindsight that that was not the right thing to do, even though everybody really loved to do it. Knock on wood, I kind of feel like this year it's for real. You know that that yeah, okay, this is a start. Fourth of July to me is probably a little bit better timing. I think we're a little bit early yet, but I do think it's going to be a good kickstart to the summer season. Um, Robert's newsletter that came out. Uh, one of the headlines on it, uh, weekly U.S. hotel occupancy reaches 60% at first since the pandemic. So right. that was very exciting. Of course, then he went down to continue to downplay it and <laughs> compare it with a whole bunch of negative things. Which, Robert, I'm just going to ignore all the rest of that. Right. Um, <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Dell Gutman. How are you this morning? Happy <laughs> soon-to-be Memorial Day weekend. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Hi, Dean. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Great, we were thank just talking you. talking about whether the, the exuberance of this holiday will get overshadowed or will overshadow the purpose of the holiday. And then uh, Dean brought up, of course, um, how that compares to how we looked at Memorial Day last year and the differences. And then he started quoting Robert, which is always dangerous to do. I know. Uh, I cause, yeah, because Rob, Robert... Robert starts good and then ends up in tragedy and despair. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, so so in, in, it's kind of funny because as I talk to clients and we're reviewing star reports and so forth, you know, you first off have to ignore the percentage variation numbers because they're just astronomically out of whack. I mean, 867% growth, uh, you know, from annual year over year or, you know, whatever, because the numbers are irrelevant to what was happening a year ago compared to what you're doing now. And you have to look at the tangible uh, compared to your comp set. What is your occupancy compared to your comp set? What is your ADR compared to your comp set? Not your indexing scores, not your variations of indexing score, your percentage. You have to almost just blind eye that and say, okay, don't, don't, don't pat yourself on the back for some sort of growth that doesn't really show correctly. Um, but in the conversations, it's like, Congratulations, it looks like your weekends are improving. I know you're not in an occupancy at 56 or 72% or 62% that is what you would be totally happy with normally. But in comparison to what we've just been going through, yay! It's all relative, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a, a bittersweet, sour patch candy kind of thing. It's like, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you. you know, it's, it's, it's back and forth between the good and the bad when you're going through the numbers and so forth. I don't know what do you guys. You know, I, I think you just got to take the win. I mean. Yeah, I yeah. do feel though that there is a there is some false exuberance 
saying, oh, we're busy and the flights are going and I know my friends are, are traveling and, and I'm beginning to see, you know, travel pictures much more on Facebook and all of those positive things. But it's not like sitting, uh, the hotels are just sitting there counting the money right now. They mm-hmm. just suffered more than a year of pain and it's going to take a long time to recover from that. Yeah. And I I do still think that even though things will things will bounce back, uh, it will feel like it's a a wild upswing, but but actually it's gonna be a while before our average rates and our occupancy and just the the consistency of the travel is going to be fully recovered. Mm-hmm. Sure. By the way, Adele, I'm just going to break our conversation for just a moment. It's not microphone envy or anything like this, but <laughs> I am I am loving on your microphone and 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 what it's doing with your voice now. You remind me, and this is going to date me, of some late night album disc jockey from a you know album FM radio station. That girl that you're always like, hey, I wonder what she looks like. You know, I hope she looks as good as she sounds because <laughs> yours sounds like. Hi, welcome to the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Pillow talk with Delilah. <laughs> you know what? I I I was being uh, interviewed by David Mignano. I think uh, is his the way he pronounces his last name. He has a podcast called "Be Our Guest," and I said. I have a beautiful microphone. I asked him if he could hear me. I have a beautiful microphone, but I can't plug it into my computer because all of my USB ports are taken. He said, but you can buy one of those things that have a lot of USB ports. And I looked down at my feet only to find this. <laughs> I mean, it was inches away from me. Uh, and I could have been using it all along, but I'm uh, glad that it's working out better. It sounds it's, you better. sound wonderful. Uh, and, and, you know, you always look wonderful, but you sound wonderful. And now you sound like exactly what I would think of as a late night album uh, disc jockey from an FM station in New York. Be like, hi there. <laughs> um, I used to be that guy. Don't knock it. <laughs> yeah, right. See, you know, and, and it cool shows, game. Dean, you have such a wonderful he does. voice. He does. He does. He has a radio voice. And I have a face for radio. I, obviously, as I was talking about with the dermatology <laughs> visit, where I'm, I'm going to forever have, have my hand voice. on my face today as I talk. I'm not going to be lazy or distract. It's just I'm trying to cover up the fact that I've stuck a band aid on my face. Hey, there he is. Look at I look. say we don't usually oh. see it, but I've got one of these things hanging in front. Look at of this me. microphone hour. It's like, hi, yeah, we're cool. We have. Oh, I need one of those flat things that you guys have. Pop screens, pop screens. Well, you you have a muffle mic on it. You have yeah. a, you have a phone mic on. Okay. So a windsock, as we used to call it. Yeah. Well, no, technically windsocks was a fuzzy furry one. Well, that's but true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But, because God knows I have enough geeky stuff around here that I have all those little variations there. But anyway, okay. So now that we've talked about technology and microphones and microphone envy and my microphone is as big as your microphone, uh, <laughs> I did want to kind of hit on something that we, uh, Adele, I think you caught a little bit of it this week when we were on the clubhouse, but I know Dean, you were, you were with me on a couple of things. I kind of made up this phrase that I'm going to, that I'm going to actually carry on forward on some future discussions as well. But it was a combination of saying emergence, convergence, and opt- uh, uh, organizational optimization, operational op- optimization. Because I think what's happening now is you're seeing a lot of articles. Well, a lot of people have been pontificating, are beating their chest saying, I told you so, which is like, okay, great, good, congratulations. You picked one lottery number. Um, well, and it was and then the you obvious. have other people. Huh? <laughs> and it was the obvious one. And it was the obvious one. Duh, this is going to happen when it happens. Right? Yeah, really? You think? Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Obvious. That sounds about right. Um, but, but I think getting in our way now is – we're not translating the anticipation of what we thought was going to happen with the realities of how we're going to have to deal with it to the re- to the translation of how we actually operate. How and and I talked to Dean just before just before we jumped on. I just threw at him the idea of saying, "Look, I think what's getting in our way is we have a misconstrued perception of milestones, benchmarks, and goals. I think we interchangeably use the terms, but they're not interchangeable. We we defer a lot of things." Uh, because this weekend is a great example. Okay, uh, we'll worry about that after this holiday weekend. Let's get through this holiday, okay? And from a marketing perspective, I can tell you that I shut off most of my marketing beginning of this week because I've already sold this weekend and uh, uh, behaviorally, people do not think past their next event. 
So this is their event. And so if I haven't already sold them into this weekend, it's not like everything's shut off, don't, I mean, I'm being, but, but all the uh, all the broad marketing categorizations, uh, and Dean, just make you feel better message, stayed on, just, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, it's also a slower boat to turn too. That doesn't happen overnight. You just don't flip a switch and it shuts off. But um, the not idea- not entirely be accurate. Anyway, I don't know, <laughs> I know. It's gotten better. It has gotten better. I do There's have ways. to do it. There's ways. Yeah. So, Anyway, but but everybody's focus is on this weekend, and ever and nobody's thinking about past this weekend until this weekend passes, and and so we do that in business too. It's it's when we have an X level of business, or when we have enough business, and sometimes we don't have a number to it. Just when we have enough business, we'll fill that salesperson's chair. Okay, we have to have enough people calling us about those kind of things to justify we need to put a person back in that chair, or. Um, Hey, you know what? We're not going to worry about that campaign because it's crazy busy right now. Until we get our head above water with what we're doing, we don't need to market ourselves for more business because we can't handle the business we have. And they lose perspective that it's not about selling current business. It's about laying the groundwork for your future representation. They lose that perspective. They see it as if I advertise now, I'm going to have more of a problem I already have. And it's like, no, you're you're not going to have a problem later on with it because you're not going to have anybody aware of what you're capable of selling later when the demand isn't as the, as it is right now. We all have to live through the tsunami first. So you're talking um, about a, you're talking about basically being a difference between being reactive, a, a cause and effect scenario, as opposed to being proactive, a build it and they will come. Right, and strategic. You know, right. uh, uh, building out the idea of how how you're looking at your entire timeline, not what just is in front of your nose right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what I think is operationally getting in the way right now is that some people, a lot of people that I'm coming across are all about the here now, what's the problem now, issues now, solutions now thing. And not everything can get solved right now. Right now, the realities are truly what we talk about. There is a labor shortage. There is a talent shortage. Um, there is... Um, a lot of hotels did not prepare themselves in the time that they had to prepare, which we were, you know, vanguarding for such a long time. We're like, guys, this is time to upgrade your tech. Guys, this is the time to clean house and reorganize use yourself. Guys, stop. <laughs> yeah, to use the pit stop, pull the engine, do the heavy lifting stuff, do your updates in your website, whatever it is. And now that you didn't, and now all of a sudden the business is coming in, <laughs> that's it. You didn't you didn't improve the motor on the rowboat, so you just got a rowboat. You know, it, it's you are what you are right now. So now you have to figure out what to do about that. And yes, there's still things, you know, you're not dead in the water, so to speak, uh, but you're not going to have the same options that somebody that did do it has. You know, there's a lot yeah. of businesses that took advantage of the opportunity to do better for themselves. And they're riding the wave like a surfer on a contest in Hawaii. They're just, yeah, got it, you know. And yeah. other, all the rest of us are drowning and flip-flopping in the rip current, you know, that are just don't know what to do. Go ahead, Adele. I'm sorry. It's it's like uh, what our friends uh, Amy Infante and Holly Zoba are always saying. You have to be working those relationships in order to have that business there for you in six months, in nine months, a year from now. Uh, you you're creating your future today. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't plant seeds and they uh, for them to bloom into flowers tomorrow you have to be thoughtful about what are you doing today to to grow your garden. And right. and you do need to have a vision of what you want that to look like and then think backwards as to, well, what steps do I need to be doing, even if it's just a little bit every day to, to work towards that. Uh, I think Amy says that it takes like 12 calls uh, before, you know, a an agreement is made on actually having a piece of business. People mm -hmm. think it's going it, to, they give up at one, two, three calls, but actually it takes much longer. You know, I, I'm going to quote our, our inner Tim Peter today uh, in, in the sense that uh, there's um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The <laughs> second best time is today. <laughs> wonderful. That's a wonderful quote. Yeah, it is a wonderful, you know, in that sense, you know, and then the shipwreck thing and everything else. But um, the 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 idea of it is, to your point, that I think too many. It's like when you go into a meeting, okay? That here's two scenarios: a meeting that you know a lot's going to get talked about, but nobody's telling you what you're talking about until you sit down, and then you got to shoot from the hip, 
and and you're just reacting to everything that's being said and you're being asked to make decisions, but you haven't had enough time to even absorb the data, let alone know all the data that's involved with the decision. Oh, kind of like Robert's email before the show. Okay, <laughs> you know, kind of like Robert's email before the show. It's like, hey, here's everything. Good luck. Hey, five minutes. Uh, which is better than 10 minutes into it going, oh, I sent it to you already. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> or going into a meeting that they've already sent you the context of the meeting, the agenda of the meeting, and supporting documentation of what will be discussed in the meeting. So now you've had the time to review, preview, and assess what it is that you think whatever it is your participation would be into it. So when you go into the meeting, it isn't this shoot from the hip mentality. Things will dynamically change in the meeting. That's why there's a meeting. But the concept of the productivity of that meeting has fundamentally changed because you were prepared for it. You know, instead of reacting to the content as presented, you are proactively engaging with what you've already planned to have in the part of the dialogue. So more constructive uh, dialogue comes out of that meeting. That's a little bit of what we're talking about with current reaction of, uh, they're bringing people on board because of whatever criteria they've established saying, okay, we now need that person. And that person is walking into a maelstrom of stuff. They're just like, okay, hey, listen, it's gonna be you know, cranking here. You're gonna be at the front desk. Uh, you're gonna be the second person. We usually get about 30, 40 in the line. Uh, this is the PMS system. I know you're not fully trained on it, but here's the, the basic functionality of what you need. That goes about guess number two before something comes up that wasn't shown. Now there's a delay. Now there's a, now the person has to come on and go, oh, you need to do this. And when you do that lack of preparation where why wasn't that person brought on board, trained properly and put in a position of success before you totally torch them where they're like, I don't want to do this. These people are so mad at me because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I don't know what the hell I'm doing because they didn't tell me how to do this stuff. I'm out of here, you know, and Absolutely. That's happening, you know, uh, yes. in a lot of scale, a lot of scale. That's just a silly example, but that's just one example. So, uh, you know, I was just watching uh, a, a broadcast uh, a few minutes before joining in and it had uh, the headhunter, uh, Jeremy Nichols, and it had the uh, hotel expert, uh, Christine Trippi, uh, talking about the whole onboarding experience and the interview experience and how, you know, we really need to re-examine that. And, and she talks about the only time this ever happened to her, 20 years ago, she took a job as a uh, event planner or something like that in a hotel, and there were roses for her on her desk. And she has told like a million people now <laughs> about this experience. It made her feel so wonderful and welcome. But also, there are so many things that you can do that are so practical, like have an online tool where you have your standard operating procedures, where you have, and I hope that those standard operating procedures should all be rewritten to include the hospitality in them and not be transactional, but um, be rewritten to actually evoke uh, somebody behaving in a way that meets your goals and your vision and your uh, company culture that you want to have in the future. Not the one you have now, but the one you aspire to. Um, have those little training videos available because when you're in this tornado, it's hard to get somebody's attention to really pay attention to you and have uh, that great one-on-one -on -one training that you may want on your first day or your first week. But if you have your best people all sharing um, tidbits of their best advice uh, for people who are coming that are new, then, you know, that person might leave one day, but now you've got it recorded. And, and that person can watch it in their own time without taking the time of someone else. And then the one-on-one -on -one can support that rather than require as much time from the from the other uh, hospitality uh, uh, guest service agent or whoever it is, um, or the sales manager that has other things to do. It, that is just uh, it, it, it's just so useful to use technology to speed things up. I'll, I'll refer to a conversation I've had now, unfortunately, repetitively with different clients, and I'm not going to call them out on it, but they know who they are because I told them this into their face anyway. <sighs> We're going to have a marketing call. Okay. GM shows up and corporate officer, 
whatever corporate person is there. And um, first thing I hear from the GM, oh, hey, guys, listen, it's got to be short. It's got to be brief. It's got to be to the point. I'm working 80 plus hours this week. I'm totally torched. I got not enough people. I got 86 check-ins today. You know, I got 44 checkouts, blah, blah, blah. I got my restaurant server. And we get five minutes of talking about how he is killing himself. Partially because it's in front of the corporate person to remind the corporate person from all the other politics that are going on. It's like, why am I not getting more people? Why aren't you giving me more opportunities to be helpful? Uh, whatever it is, the politics of talking about it come into play. And I look and I was like, man, I, I was that person. I, I was that person that totally cr- just buried myself into that role. I mean, I was, if, it, if somebody didn't show, and I wanted to show my team that I could do the job so that they could respect me when I asked them to do what work I was asking them. I did all those things. I did the 80, 120 hours. Oh, yeah, well, hell, 80, that was a weekend. You know, it don't count. It doesn't count. At the end of the day, it doesn't count. What you're dealing with is the fact that um, if you stop doing it, they'll get the next person to do it. It may take them time and it may not whatever, and it may not be the better than you or whatever. But at the end of the day, I was told by somebody that worked with me that it's like, look, the owners of this company are going to appreciate the heck out of what you do. Okay, they're just going to be thankful for it and everything else like that. But they're going to come to your funeral. They're going to say he was a good guy. And as they're walking past your grave, they're going to say, and who's sitting in his chair now? Because it's business. It's what you do. So the fact that somebody is restrict is, is reduced to having to work at those levels to do that kind of work without the resource. I understand there's there's just, you know, even if corporate was desperately trying to find people for you, what if they were there? They were there. Corporate's not on your doorstep. They're not helping. I have another client that the corporate people are actually showing up pulling desk shifts because their corporate office is in the same region that the rest that the hotels are located at. And they're showing up pulling shifts. That's awesome. But it's still not solving the problem. It's only putting a, 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 a bandaid on in that sense um, of, you know, the problem is to what you just said, Adele, if you can't find the people to do it, find the means to train the people that you have to do better. It's still not probably going to solve the whole thing, but go ahead. Uh, definitely. And the thing is that people say they don't have time, perhaps, to record the message or to, um, you know, to they don't have the time to prepare that body of work. <laughs> you but did. Imagine how much time it will save you. Right. You're just spinning on your hamster wheel, doing the same thing again and again and again, because you won't stop to take a moment to do it once really beautifully on uh, on a recording. By the way, if it's not so beautiful, you can always change it. You can mm. you, you can you can make a new video like that. And you'll probably but, have to because things change, right? Yes, it has to be a little by dynamic. You you add in a chapter, whatever it may be, and and yeah, we just had an entire year of a pit stop, folks. <laughs> you know? right. So where's the where there's an opportunity right now for people to do exactly what you're talking about? You know, we we think of vacations right now as being going to the beach and things like that, mountain resorts, your ski lodges, things like that. Okay, you're in a downtime right now. Everything we're talking about here's your opportunity. You're in the space where you can do that right now. Uh, and, and I bring this up because I'm actually talking to a few that, I, to their credit, are doing exactly that. They're putting in programs, experimenting with things. They're like, yeah, I'd never tried this in January, but here it is in, in July. Yeah, I can do this now, right? Now's the time to toy with that stuff so that come high season, you are ready to go. If, if I were asked uh, what would be the one technology tool that I would choose I mean, I think that everybody definitely wants the contactless <laughs> check-in and things like that. But you know what? It would be a communication tool for my team because I, I, I just don't have the time to train every single individual in the entire company one by one. And they come and they, they go. If I communicate the vision and how we're going to do it and all the great ideas that we have and the things that we've learned and everybody is chiming in with their own videos, expressing something really wonderful that they're doing that they think that everybody else should know. Then I have a body of work so that when someone starts off at a company, they know 
what we're about, what we care about, what we prioritize, um, that we're here for you, that there's a place where if you don't know what you're supposed to do, you can find information on it on your phone or you know how to get that information. It is look, not expensive. You, you bring up a really good point. I don't want to lose. I want to bring back to something we started with and then go into this because I think you're hitting on something very profound. Um, just personally, that I think what we're talking about at this point also is uh, the issue that I've talked about with milestones, goals and, and, and benchmarks is until we get to a certain threshold, a condition of, that has been predetermined by whomever, then a solution doesn't get forwarded. I mean, right now, and I, I, I mean this sincerely, I think a lot of businesses are looking to reclaim a lot of their losses before they do any sort of reinvestment into what they're doing. Uh, look, I got to make up some of the, the blood I lost uh, this past year before I can start putting more money into the things. You know, you, you preach to the choir. I know I need a new pit text sack. I know I need more people. I know I need to change salaries. I know I, I don't have the current coffers to do this. I've I've been bled down to the point where I only have this much money to sustain operations. I need to reclaim some of that, which then leads to other poor decisions or, you know, the decisions that they make of overselling the service capacity of, of racking rates that shouldn't exist for what they're offering as product and burning their bridges in future tense lifetime value of people and or repeat business simply to make the dollar now that they need to put back into the coffer that they feel that they have to balance back out. I think that that is an influence on a lot of company businesses right now. But and then in those milestones that people artificially put in their head, like, well, when we get to this point, we'll do this. Or when we get to here, we'll do this. Or once we get past this, we'll do this. OK, um, but you bring up a really good point, Adele, and that is you think about all the successful communication channels that exist in other places of the world. For instance, the military, every squad person now has microphone headsets. That was always the thing, you know, you watch the old movies and it's like, mm, mm, and there's hand gestures because they had to communicate, but they couldn't be, you know, and that's probably still exists. But the idea that they're in real time talking and, and the fact that there's drones flying around and telling the soldiers where all the bad guys are and, and all this other stuff is communication. It's, it's, it's information and communication. OK, so let's take my really crappy example of putting in somebody into the line of fire at a front desk that wasn't fully trained. Putting a headset on them and letting them connect to somebody that might have the answers might help lessen the damage that they were causing by simply that person going, um, I, oh, hey, look, I'm stuck. This person wants X, Y, Z, and I don't know how to do X, Y, Z. Okay, look at your screen, right? Upper left-hand corner, click that. At least maybe that would dampen it down. It doesn't It's not the best solution, but it's certainly a better than not giving them that part. Then look at our industry, uh, Four Seasons. Back before there was better technology, I used to love looking at the Four Seasons staff because they reminded me of the CIA, the little head buds with the little wires and the little talky things, you know, and that's how they did stuff. And you, the Four Seasons experience, you showed up and the person opening your door, welcome, welcome to Four Seasons, blah, blah, blah. Uh, to, to, who do we have the pleasure of introducing or inviting today? And they said, oh, my Lauren Gray. Okay, Lauren Gray. And boom, by the time you hit the door, the, bell, the doorman was already talking about your name. By the time you went into the lobby, you weren't going to the front desk. You're greeted by the person that was going to introduce themselves to bring you to your room with your name, knowing your history of where you were, knowing what you were there for, when the last time you were there, where you were there, what you did the last time you were there. Mr. Grace, by the way, I noticed that you enjoyed our spa last time. I just took the liberty of going over and holding a little time. If you're interested, we can. Woo! And it was all from what you just said, Adele, communication. It was making sure we all knew what was going on. And people were just amazed, like, oh, my gosh, I love this place. You know, and it's true. Like it's good because that's yeah. what they focused on was that. Now, you you know what? I I once was talking to uh, John Tabawada, the general manager of the Casablanca Hotel, whose hotel was number one on TripAdvisor or number two or number three for years, but it was solidly number one without a day at number two for three and a half years in a row. And, uh, and he said to me, you know, Adele, the staff perform so well because they feel so comfortable because they know exactly what our goal is. They know exactly what is important to us. They know exactly that, you know, whatever they do in order to make sure that that guest 
is in love with us and just feels like family that that we absolutely give them permission to do what they need to do within just some reasonable parameters of course that mm -hmm. that that come with the training but they are they are free to do what they need to do to make people happy because that we want customers for life that knowing that gives them so much freedom and because when there was a problem if there's a problem he would take them and say come with me uh, I ha just had a complaint by somebody. I'm going to talk to them. Why don't you come with me so you see how we handle it? And that that side by side training is amazing. And mm -hmm. and the I just I just wish that I could have him record everything that he does so that any time if he ever left the company that that would be in the um, that would be in the archives for anybody well, else that came you know you bring up a, another excellent point as well and that is um trust uh everybody on your team knows who's the weakest link on mm -hmm. whatever it is that they're weak link on not everybody's a weak link on everything but you know and so if you're not culling the herd so to speak if you're not keeping a standard of performance for everyone that everyone is pacing themselves against then you get people where, oh, Bob's up there. <laughs> Good luck with that. Because they already know Bob's not going to do well. You need to, and going back to the military angle again, from a squad's point of view, you need to trust that the person to your left is watching your left. The person to your right is watching your right. You're watching the front. They're trusting you that you're watching the front. That team spirit of collaboration, that pace that you just talked about, everybody was trying to excel because they're measured against everybody else excelling as well. And not in a, not in a, highly competitive, negative shark tank way, but in a, we're part of the same collaboration. I want to be worthy of whom I'm a part of the team of. That that willingness to be a part of a good team, when you get that culture, it's magic. It's, I mean, everybody is finding ways to do better. Everybody is helping each other to, and not, not helping to finding ways to do better so that they can shine. They're finding ways so that we all shine. It comes out being that, um, we did well. This person had an amazing experience with us, not because of exactly one little thing I did or one little thing Dean did or you did. It's the fact that cumulatively, there was never a missed beat. I trusted Dean and Adele to do exactly what I did was to make sure that everything we could do was done and that that guest had what they wanted to. The, we're talking about almost wishful, you know, oh, I remember those days because a lot of hotels, that's not what they're thinking right now. It's they're thinking, true. you know what? I got one warm body. That's all I got. And they're yeah. they're they're looking to blame somebody else. They're looking to say, look, hey, it's not my problem. It's not my fault. I I didn't create this scenario. I can't create you know people out of thin air. I can't you know. But the ownership is telling me to sell every room I have when I know I can only service half of them. But I want my paycheck, so I'm going to do this. And and you know, it's their problem if they lose guests, and it's my problem for whatever. If my, you know, if if they can't pay me tomorrow, I'll go find another job. Yeah, you know, I interviewed also um, Jeff Kulik, uh, the general manager. I think he's vice president also of the the London Hotel in West Hollywood. And uh, you know what? I really knew him from people who worked for him at one point in their lives and say what an incredible mentor and an incredible hospitality leader he was. And uh, you know, he, he said if people would just stop treating uh, the viewing their staff members as a pair of hands and believing that they're just there to pick up the paycheck and they treat them as future leaders, uh, it's amazing what people will will do for you. And it is so, so satisfying to know that you're really helping people bloom and helping people um, rise to the occasion and 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 grow. And I think that that's, I think that that path to uh, professional development that you can just come to this country and 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 start out from wherever you are and get a job in hospitality, work hard, do well, participate, uh, learn, enjoy loving service and making people happy. And, and you will, you can, just like anybody else can, become 
as far as, uh, you know, grow as far as you want to go in your profession and really change your circumstances for yourself and for the people you love. And, and I really believe in that. And yet the other day, uh, is it Sloan Dean? Is that his name? The, from, uh, yeah, yeah, from Sloan, yeah, with, yeah. What's yeah, what? I almost cried yesterday <laughs> because I, I read, uh, I think, I think Jason, um, Freed put it out on the hotel recovery that he said, um, you know, people are just showing up for their paycheck and they're not interested in the professional path. I, I, I just can't believe that he really feels that way. I, well I have opinions about Sloan. Sloan is brilliant, by the way. And, I and, know and, he is, and I know he's such a good person. Well, and yeah, but also Sloan has gotten to be about Sloan Dean. <laughs> I'm sorry, he used to be so much different than what he was now. Now that he's in charge of the company, he it's Sloan Dean says, and Sloan Dean does. And, Sloan, and I almost kind of feel because of his obligation at his current level that this was a disclaimer to answers that he's given ownerships that he's responsible to now as to why he's having obstacles with stuff. Because if you look at some of the old Sloan Dean stuff, Sloan Dean was always at places celebrating staff members and associates and achievements and, and culture and, 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 and that camaraderie of what the company was representing. And that was one of the companies that hacked a lot of people away. They, they furloughed a whole lot of people under Sloan's leadership. And then now Sloan is in charge and he has to answer to people as to why their performances are changing. And it's not a financial choice for the first time. His incredible knowledge about revenue management, yielding business operations, you know, legalities of asset management and so forth. This is, to our point, a human issue. It's not a business issue. It's a human issue. And, and I'm not trying to bash Sloan. Sloan, again, I told you, it's absolutely freaking brilliant. It just, indeed, I, I've seen his personality change over time. Personally, I feel this is all my personal opinion is that I think he's now in the role that he in, is in, has to start laying track on reasons why he can't influence the things that he used to take credit for, that they weren't there for that reason. He he was a, the, the product of success of the business that they did was because of how they were doing business at the time. And now that isn't how they're doing business. And he has to explain that. So I don't know, but I agree with you. It's sad that somebody in the leadership of a large organization, as large as they are, is throwing in the towel and saying, it's 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 just these people don't care. Wow, well, thanks for well, solving the problem. Sloan, call me. <laughs> yeah. It, it, call me and let me let me let me talk to you about it because I I really do believe as hospitality leaders, it's our responsibility to inspire our team to love the idea of serving people. It is our responsibility to make them feel like a very important and valuable player and that it is our responsibility to train and coach and empower and let each individual fulfill their full potential as a contributor. And, and you know, if people don't care, very often it's because they perceive that we don't care about them and we don't care about solving the problems of the guests, which uh, are being ignored. Yeah. I was just saying, Theo mentioned that, that Remington, it's Sloan is, is, is Remington. I, I, I really, I welcome anybody, including Sloan, to ever come back and, and express his opinion about this because I get the benefit of being a third party person not responsible for the levels of responsibility he has. So I get to have an opinion about like, hey, I don't know all the things you're dealing with, but from the outside, you look like you've changed from this to this. It, it, I'm sure there's all good reasons for it. He, he represents millions of dollars of investment. His, his asset control was something he did for a long time and his revenue management is brilliant. I mean, I, I, I spoke at his thing in Dallas. I've, I've talked to him, I've known him personally, everything else. I'd say the same thing to him. It's like, look, dude, you've changed. You, you, this would not be something I thought you would say six years ago. I don't think you would, because you were six years ago taking pictures with housekeepers saying, isn't it great we have this program? Isn't it great that we have a team like this? And now you're saying, hey, these people, man, they just want a paycheck. What the heck? Yeah. Why, why the change? 
because of the role he's changed in. He's now yeah. the CEO of the place. Okay. And I've you got know, a, I got a real estate and stop talking about Sloan here for a minute. I know it's not about Sloan anymore. <laughs> Sloan, come on. I'm going to play Libby here for uh, Lily here for a second. <laughs> Reel it all back in. I have a revenue management question for everyone. I saw we had Theo and Theo. I think I, if you're who I think you are, you'll have an opinion on this as well. Um, so I saw a survey on LinkedIn the other day and on it, they were t uh, posting a scenario where uh, they had a hotel at 90 percent occupancy and the owners of corporate, whoever it may be, really wanted to hit 100 percent occupancy. They wanted to have full sellout. Right. And in spite of the revenue manager saying, hey, you know, 100 percent is not necessarily as important as you might think it is. Uh, and again, Lauren, as you brought up staffing concerns and all those different elements, too. Uh, but the, the owner was still insistent. No, 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 no. We, I want to get that perfect sellout. OK, cool. So they were posting. All right. How do we do this? Knowing that the owner has gone all in on saying they want to do this. And they posted four different options. Uh, one was to, of course, drop price, right? So am I just going to drop the price down until I sell out? Uh, two was to actually raise rates and control those last 10%. Three was to add value. So actually increase rates and add values. So it's a little bit more expensive, but you're getting more for it. And the fourth one was to add length of stay. All right. Now, I will tell you that. So, you know, on LinkedIn, when you click on one of them, you get to see the, the current results. The one that was the favored or the, the had the most responses of those four was the add value and increase the prices on it. OK, I'd like I have my own opinion on that. But before I put my opinion out, I want to hear everybody else. Theo, I'd love to hear yours. Oh, Theo, I think you're linking to it there, actually. That's probably the one. Let's see well, that. no, that's, that's, oh, that's something else. Oh, that's something else. OK, never mind. That, that's the continuation of the conversation from Sloan. So even though you're trying to get rid of it, <laughs> Dean, <laughs> It came Dumb back at you. No, I'm just done with slow. Yeah, and we're not out here to go over and and, and point people. It's just it's it's the unfortunate reality of of us as an industry looking. You know, we 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 always want to cast blame and we always want to point at people other than. So when we talk about people. revenue management, <laughs> yeah. well, revenue well, management. Slow. First off, I agree with you. 100 percent occupancy. The revenue manager is correct. Um, there should not be the the mantle of oh holy grail 100 percent occupancy it doesn't we, we mathematically we know that that is never a good thing there's a diminished value of return and so forth and so on capacities wearability on the capital product all that kind of stuff to answer your question i would say in all honesty if you truly were trying to strive for 100 percent occupancy um your only real lever is lowering rate and you can value add all you want but if you have, because you, you're basing the answer of adding value and unconstrained demand, and you don't know the demand to market. So because of that, you're assuming by creating a modifier of value that their demand unconstrained will fill that gap that you have. It's not. The only thing that you can do to do 100% occupancy at that demand cycle where you're only 10 points off from your market demand is to steal demand from another supplier by augmenting your rate to taking it from them. I'm not saying it's what you want to do. I'm just saying that if you're looking for that holy mantle of 100%, then lower your rate and get the 100%. So my, my concern on the the answer that was given was, uh, or the favorite answer was, again, upping the rate and adding value. My concern on that was that you've got 90% of your hotel booked without the added value. Granted, they're at a lower rate, but they didn't get the added value. Right. So now what if even just one percent of those five people come in and say, well, wait a minute, why didn't I get that? Does that create a problem for your existing? No, because you, you raise the rate. I mean, people know they can't get into first class without paying for it. So if you have a higher rate and you're offering value to it, you can't whine about the fact. Why didn't they get free dinner like they got free dinner? Well, they yeah. freaking paid for it because they paid more. Yeah. I mean, that that rationale fits. If you gave increased value without raising the rate, now you got a problem. There you go. But by raising the rate. And adding value, okay, where the people I that didn't get it say, hey, I didn't want it anyway, so I didn't have to pay for it. Uh, where I would have seen the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, where I would have seen the opportunity is actually kind of a combination, a hybrid of what you said. Yes, I need to lower the rate to get that last 10%, but being cautious of the fact that, by the way, you've got 90% of your people booked, and now you're putting a lower rate out there. So tying that to a length of stay. Because now, yeah, I'll give you that lower rate, but I got to have a three night length of stay out of it. If I'm that close to being full, anybody else coming in, I want you to be here a while. I definitely uh, 
I don't actually think we make people change their minds that we're coming for a one night stay and they're going to make them stay oh, no. for three nights. No, I don't want that but saying no, when once you're within your range where, you know, I have, you know, seven days coming up and I can sell that many rooms on that day in uh, in one day. So why am I going to allow that to happen when I can take, uh, put it on no arrival to help it uh, do the, the earlier day, if that's yeah. what I need, or just make it a minimum stay? It depends on, on, on the situation. Sometimes yeah. no arrival works better than a minimum stay, it, depending on what you're looking for. So I definitely feel that restrictions are super important on getting uh, a, a full house. Uh, but I was always happy with 92, 95% occupancy, 96% occupancy. But when it came to, as I came up to the week and I had 95% occupancy, I was like, what am I going to do to sell those last few rooms? And right. y usually it's marketed or tell the, the front desk to be flexible or sometimes lowering the rate of your your suite for an upgrade for example at the last minute can help can help your well that helps really more with the ADR but sometimes it can close the deal too yeah. make it more attractive than than another place sometimes we make our suites so much more than the rooms that you end up just upgrading people without without any extra money. It doesn't make any sense. You should use that in your marketing. Uh, that's how I feel. Now, I am definitely all for the value add because, uh, you know, I came from the last 20 years having every, I mean, people would tell me that, wow, your, your hotels, ADR is just astonishing and your, and your average, uh, your occupancy is, is amazing because we gave the uh, the the wine and cheese and the breakfast and the all day coffee tea cookies and fruit in the club room along with really warm welcoming service in that club lounge and it helped make people love us and it really enhanced and it was a differentiator between us and every other hotel the cost to deliver that per person was extraordinarily low compared to it was a a you know small small percent of the value add. If you paid for that in New York, for a couple it might be over two hundred dollars. If you really took advantage of everything, yeah. But yeah. what it actually cost us was was quite minimal because we were giving it to everybody. So we were buying you know consistently in bulk and with contracts and 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 of course. And I'll tell you, so that works amazingly well so now let's take it to the other extreme uh not doing like the state restrictions and stuff like that but tying into one of robert's articles today saber partners with by hours to sell rooms by the hour mm -hmm. and most of us who have been in hospitality for a while when we say rooms by the hour it takes a whole different meaning actually that historically has been a much different type of clientele but in the last year with covid that by the hour has been office space Right. So let's think about that scenario. So I've got that extra, maybe I have 4% left of my occupancy or 10%, whatever. By the hour, is that something I'm willing to do? Sell out, sell out a couple of rooms as office space? It was, you know, it was really difficult for us to do it. Every time I considered the, op the option of having the day use in the highly occupied hotels, it just didn't make sense because... I didn't want to, everybody wanted to check in in the morning and check out in the evening. It, you know, <laughs> I yeah. didn't have, I didn't have the staff to fit in another turnover of that room. And right now people don't have the staff to do the turnover. Uh, it, they are not selling rooms that they absolutely can sell for tonight. They are leaving them unbooked because they don't have anybody to clean the room before you check in today. So how are you going to fit in a one hour room? And do you really want to attract that kind of business? I was just reading uh, something that uh, somebody wrote that they have a problem with um, locals 
coming in for one night and then uh, they don't have enough money. They, they try to extend a day. They don't have enough money on the card. They feel that they, they're, people are doing it over and over again. They feel it's like drugs or it could be trafficking or could be some kind of nonsense going on. You know, why, why are they using a prepaid card anyway instead of a credit card? Uh, so many problems coming up with it. Do you really want that ruining the experience of your hotel, trashing your room? Uh, that is a, that is burns on the carpet, all kinds of terrible right. things. Why do you want that? You, you know, have some integrity. <laughs> it, 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 you know, the guests in your hotel, the kind of guests that you have in your hotel, are part yeah. of the experience. The whole digital nomad working from a hotel as my office, that's become a popular thing in the past year. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so I would definitely sell it for from 9 a.m. until 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. And I would sell it at full price, but I wouldn't sell it for an hour. I mean, unless I was getting a full, I mean, you can stay for an hour as long as you book it for a full day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving. I, 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 I had a, a hotel that's actually going and being torn down finally, Hotel Penn uh, in New York. And we had deliberated with a platform that was trying to grow. Uh, what was it called? Day, tell, day. It was a day. Th it was the idea of it was for those that were uh, flying over and had just short layovers between flights and or things. And they had gap points that the hotel could sell the same room that was still going to be used that evening earlier by somebody. Uh, that just needed it to for downtime. Just, you know, I need some place to be for three to six hours uh, before I go someplace else. And it's not like I'm having to have the room for the whole evening and so forth. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it never seemed to quite fit into the cost ratio versus the aggravation ratio versus the opportunity ratio. Because if at first it was like, oh, great, we have downtime rooms. It requires double cleaning and all this other stuff, but you know, it, is it worth it? We get to sell it for a little bit, and and I guess it's the stigma of it still is, it kind of floats around with this like my no tell yeah. motel kind of mentality. Right. Like you know, here's your towels and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, well, uh, yeah. I did do do it for one one hotel um, in Toronto because it was a big hotel and it wasn't fully sold out, so. I did have plenty of available rooms and I could just say these rooms cost just as much as if you stay overnight, but you have it from nine until seven and you get to just spend the day with us, enjoy the resort facilities and, uh, you know, do your work, do get your workout, go to the pool, whatever you need to do. And, uh, but, it, but the same cost, I do believe that you should have flexibility because imagine if you do need, if you are flying in from another country, I wish that was happening more right, right now. Uh, and, and you, and your flight comes in at 7 AM and you need a, a place starting at nine and ending at seven so that you can go back to the airport and fly out and you want to make it more of an experience. They should pay for that full day, but they shouldn't have to pay for two days. If it's not displacing a two night booking. Mm -hmm. That's right. the key. All right. I think what we'll have, and this really depends on the traveling cycle. It's so hard. I mean, Kim, in current circumstances, we see all this business that's rolling. I mean, we've, Dean, just before we started, we made the comment 600 million people are flying and estimated this weekend. 38 million plus people are driving this weekend. It is up 600% compared to what was happening last year, which is not even a fair comparison, as I mentioned, taking numbers in comparison to last year to this year. Uh, purpose of travel, we talked about as being hopefully different than what it was uh, last year. But all said and same, it's hard for us to rationalize what future business opportunities like this are going to look like once this tsunami hits and recedes and, and more business cycles begin to roll in. Have we as a society culturally changed our travel interests? Have we having it taken away from us? Have we now cherished it more the idea of travel of now that we have experienced the fact that we couldn't travel for reasons this past year to, you know, uh, uh, was it uh, distance makes the heart grow fonder kind of mentality? Having had it taken out of our lives, have we now found a new sense of value to it that we maybe took for granted up to the point where we had it taken away from us? 
Um, and, and from that reason, we're going to have lots more excuses to travel, blending it with work differently, yeah. blending with family differently, uh, durations being different, uh, destination interests. Like I'm going to hit my bucket list sooner, you know, mentality of like, I'm going to go to these places now, rather than thinking I was going to do it whenever I thought I was going to do it. I'm going to put them into my timeline now. Um, it changes a lot of that in that sense. Um, as, as a Absolutely. person who used to travel at least once a month on business, uh, and then granted that's more business travel, but I tell you when the, when the pandemic hit and all that came to a standstill, I, I started getting a little twitchy. I'm like, I need to be going somewhere. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and I, I, for one, am very anxious to get back on the road again. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's funny, you know, we have our dialogues uh, here and we talk about the tangible uh, implementation of things The I think more closely to the rubber meets the road mentality, the functional solution processes that hotels are trying to face. And then there's other programs that go in and talk about the higher level dialogues of, of large shifting and moving of companies, how, how companies are blending their large strategies with other concepts and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, you see the conversations in Clubhouse, you see uh, other broadcasts and so forth. All those conversations are valuable because even though I listen to some programming that's talking with some CEO, go back to the Sloan thing for just the lack of a reference point. People like Sloan that are talking about high level perspectives. Okay. I can look from the ground level and go, why is that? Why are you, why are you saying that? Why are you doing that stuff? They have their reasons. They have their purposes. They are, they're responsible for a lot of stuff uh, and, and massive amounts of money and massive obligations of money and everything else. And they have to make very large decisions that from my perspective is like, well, that doesn't seem that way. I'm, Probably, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make amends to the fact that we're not trying to, you know, call anyone out for it. But there's people at levels that are making some very level, high level decisions about mergers and so forth, that the decisions are based on macroeconomics, uh, that they have to to balance out large cost decisions and take the lesser cost decision, even though we look at it and go, well, that doesn't seem to make much sense. Why wouldn't you do this instead? Because our perspective is from our own. I mean, it goes back to the person that lives on a farm all their life versus some of this travel the world. Who's happier? You know, the person that doesn't know differently outside of their own world or the person that's aware of the whole world but appreciates what they've seen. It's, it's, there's different perspectives at play. I think as an industry though, cumulatively, we're struggling with the thought process of how do we solve that? Can those two worlds exist concurrently? The big decisions that may be negative to a large scale of people in our perspective, Versus the simple things we think should get done that cost a lot for the people from their perspective. It's a it's a funky mix. I mean, again, going back to some of Robert's list, there's some big decisions being on that I don't think really understand that people understand the ramifications. That whole hotels.com headline list that he put out there. The fact that other platforms can offer different rates and not be penalized for parity to hotels.com. I think that's booking.com actually, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was booking.com. Maybe it was, was hotels. Hold on. Let me go look again. I think it was hotels, but let me see real quick. Uh, it no, in, it is. You're right. Booking.com. Booking.com. Yeah, it, it was in Europe, Europe like Germany, I yeah. think, if I remember right. In Germany, yeah. They decided yeah. that uh, uh, other platforms can offer better rates yeah. if they have them available without penalization as to, well, Booking.com says it can only yeah, offer the best rate. rate clauses. You, you <laughs> know, the only thing I'm interested in is that the hotel has the right to offer exclusive packages and offers on their own website. You know, I I don't mind having the OTAs at the same rate. That makes a lot of sense. You know, they can duke it out between themselves as long as <laughs> me, the hotelier, for the direct business, that I always have something available just for people who come to my website directly. And right. I think that the decision protected that. I, I'm not sure I understood it, but I think that the pr decision protected the hotel's avail availability, or I'm sorry, opportunity to uh, to have the lowest rate themselves. So you know I'm a fan of Book Direct. I, I believe Direct is best. And, and I love it when a hotel can offer the lowest rate for Booking Direct, but we can't always do that. Step out of hospitality for just a moment and think about your manufacturing retail environment. Apple comes out with a new iPhone or anybody comes out with a product and uh, you know, Best Buy is selling it, Walmart is selling it, Amazon is selling it, whatever the case may be, that you will not find that iPhone outside of you know, AT&T gives you credits, that kind of stuff. So outside of special package deals and contracts and stuff like that, the product itself, you will not buy for less than this price. 
That's, that's the way it should be. Yeah, well, it's what's referred to as a minimum advertised price policy. Uh, and it's something that happens between manufacturing and retail. And it has to be policed, actually. They have this kind of like rate parity for, for retail. They have to go out there and monitor that and see, okay, you know, is, is Walmart advertising this for less than the minimum advertised price? But part of the reason they do that is because as they're distributing it to all these different companies out there, uh, little company uh, G over here comes in and says, well, companies A, B, C, D, and E are all selling this too. How do I compete with them? You know, I, I can't compete with the Best Buy. They're going to offer that lower than I am. And the answer is, well, because nobody can sell at below this threshold. So it creates a level playing field. However, the big loophole in that whole thing is it means I, it's a minimum advertised price. That doesn't mean that you can't put a lower price in your store. Meaning if I go to your brick and mortar store and I show up at, at your counter and say, yeah, can you offer that for me at a lower price? You better believe you can offer that for a lower price. Same thing for booking direct, right? If somebody comes direct to you, you have that opportunity to undercut everybody. But no what if they that. come to your website? Well, see, then that becomes an advertised price. That's where there's a little bit of a challenge in there. I like undercutting the OTAs. I, I'm in favor of that. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, but that creates those those parity agreements because now all your distributors who are also trying to sell your room and want an equal shot at it are going, hey, what about me? Yeah. Well, that's why that's why I say have an exclusive package because yeah. that is just something that you can't get someplace else. It, your your bar rate, you gave them the same bar rate. You know, that that you you have that bar rate, they have that bar rate, they have that bar rate. That's okay. But now that's just that's the the that called best available rate is really your worst available rate. It's your <laughs> highest rate, right? And then you have discounts based on length of stay or right. whatever season, some some extra some extra perk is offered in it those things or having a uh, a longer cancellation time or prepaid non-refundable uh, those days are going to come back because when people start canceling like crazy with absolutely no regard to uh the airline or the hotel the hotels will all be right there with it they may already be actually this probably won't be such a big problem at the moment or so much of, a, of an impact at the moment, considering that everybody is able to opt or, uh, offer or ask for optimum rate at this point, because of the demands that are emerging, people are pretty much everybody's in concert of higher rates and so forth. It's probably when we get into the higher competitive cycles again, where we're having to facilitate which channel gets used by what rate is being offered, that this will begin to show more impact potential. Because right now, I think everybody is like, what's the rack of, what's the rate at the back of the door? Okay, that's the rate we're putting up on our platform. And everybody's putting that out. Go ahead. It's interesting because I would have thought the same. But when I've been speaking with hoteliers uh, near me in the Carolinas and say, you know, guys, just raise your rates a little bit and pay the housekeepers more. Just do it. Just pay your front desk people a little bit more. They 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 need it. They feel that they need it to live. And if you don't want them to leave your hotel and go to another hotel, just pay them what they're looking for. And and they'll say, you know, it would be okay if the government made the minimum rate this much. Uh, that way, if the minimum hourly rate was this much and everybody made it like that and everybody raised their rates in unison because in order to accommodate that, that would be okay. But for me to raise my uh, hourly rate and then I have to raise my, my uh, overnight rate accordingly, now I'm not in competition. So they're very worried about the competition, actually. To my surprise, they're not, they, I don't think that they are at their peak. Yeah, um, I think you're, you're pointing out something that is a is, um, systemic issue for us as an industry. And I don't think we're exclusive on this by any stretch. 
and that is culpability and responsibility. What you're basically saying is that if I, if you, if everybody does it, I'll do it, which is it's not under my control and my influence. Uh, and I say that from from the types of revenue managers, uh, and this is just there's revenue managers who say this is the price, and people will back into the value of what that price means. Like, well, it must be because of something, or that value must be because of this. And then you have other revenue managers who are like, this is the price. You know, as it, as if they're if you buy it, then that's the price. If it's not, then what would be the price? And what what do you think you'd be willing to pay? That uncertainty of it because they don't they're not confident in what they're selling. They're the value of what they think it is versus the price they think they can ask for it. There's a disparity between the two. Uh, we come across revenue managers all the time that they 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 have a resistance to raising rate for a couple of things. I think one politically is. If it, if their performance or their value, you know, they everyone likes to come into a room with good news. Everyone wants to go to their boss with what I've done positively, not like that's what I did, you know. So when you start pushing things that you're uncertain about and the, the results are potentially initially negative, whether that's long term or not, that creates a resistance, especially how the boss re reacts to it. If they react of don't ever do that again. Well, guess what? You're never going to have that risk taken again. That person is not going to want to put themselves into jeopardy with their superior, a supervisor, uh, on, on doing something that got that kind of response. If the the supervisor is like, hey, you tried and it didn't work. OK, now we know that that isn't really something we can do at this point, that we, this is the rate we can get. Th th that whole dynamic is probably probably one of the key elements to what you just pointed to, Adele, is to the success ratio of what you can actually ask for. The, the idea of saying, well, if everybody else charges this per hour or, you know, the first pushback that I get when you bring up that argument like you did is, well, my rates isn't directly connected to what I pay my people. I have to pay everything else, too, and everything else is more expensive and everything else I haven't had money for. And I need to put money back into my account so I can pay for this stuff. You know, PMS platforms don't grow on trees. There's deposits and and things and like blah, blah, blah. I need to have enough money to do that where I'm not putting myself below a threshold of operation which is what most people look at is like, what is my liquidity for paying my bills daily? And what is it that I have monies for other than that, that I can actually dedicate towards. Now you have software companies who have also been struggling going, well, that's the setup fee. We can't waive it. We can't split up the payments. It's you got to pay 50,000 upfront for us to start putting this together. Cause we need that money to pay our people to do the work for you. So now we create all these dominoes of conditions that are stopping us from actually being better because Everybody's holding their ground going, well, that's what you have to do. And I'm not going to give it to you until that happens. And somebody's got to blink and say, OK, you know what? I'm willing to not do it this way to get you this opportunity under the good faith trust that it's going to work out that way. You're going to pay me broken up or whatever it is, you know, whatever the conditions are. And, and a lot of companies aren't doing that yet. Now, there's some that do, but there's a lot that don't. And, and that's been, a, a, I think, an issue where it goes all the way up to the revenue manager's decisions. Can I push rate? Because is my boss going to let me push rate? Do I think I can actually ask for more rate? And, you know. If, if you're in sales marketing revenue and you're not absolutely every day testing, testing, testing to see how far you can push your rate, you're not doing the job you were hired for. So if you're if the general manager or hotel owner tells you don't push the rate, I don't know what 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 a person is supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. If we're are we not are we or are we not responsible for um, optimizing the revenue at our hotel? There's no way you can do that without testing and failing, testing and failing, testing and succeeding, testing and yeah. failing, testing, testing and test, 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 test. That's the way to do it. That's the only way to do it. When I get a bunch of reservations for a particular day, I go, I'm going to up that rate. And even if it's just by $20, you know, depending on how much time I have or mm -hmm. by $40, whatever. Uh, and, and if, and if reservations come to a stand, so oh, I, I went too far, I went down, but I, but that's, that's the process. That's how that's me trying to see how par, far I can push it. Because you know what? As much as we think that we set the rates, the market is going to tell you what they're willing to pay. Right. And at some point, they're going to say, I'm sorry, I was willing to pay $40 more than the hotel next door, but I'm not willing to pay $80 more than the 
hotel next door. Right. You, but when I interview someone about, and I ask them, you know, so tell me, you know, what's your philosophy of revenue management? What do you, how do you define it? How do you go about it? Well, the first thing I do is I look at what everybody else is charging. That is the worst way to start the conversation with me because I want to believe that uh, my revenue manager is going to be more clever and the, the, the lead, taking the lead and that everybody else will be watching what we do, but, not the other way around. But, you know, that's a great question to ask because you can immediately tell what kind of revenue manager you have. Are they browbeaten <laughs> down to do whatever it is that they were they, they're told not to do again? And just because I want to see this expression on Dean's face when I say this, Sloan Dean was brilliant at this. I mean, truly he was. <laughs> no, and I mean this. Honestly, he created the core for them. He created the core rate variation program. Yeah, <laughs> I just love it. You know, you think I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's all, actually, I have amazing respect for the man. He's absolutely freaking brilliant. And when it came to revenue management, one of the most, if not the most brilliant person I know about revenue management, but that is man still can have my opinions about him. Um, but he created a, a, a model that you just talked about, Dell, of variations of rate to always push parameters of demand. He created a model. It's not like he just made a little chart with little lines to connect it. He created an operational revenue monable construct for this. I mean, again, can totally respect a person until I have an opinion about him. So Dean, I just did that to make you smile. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Sloan Dean hour. No, it's it's <laughs> he is a great guy, honestly. He's just sometimes looking at it like, wow. Failure and accepting failure, not as failure, but as learning is is central to mm -hmm. becoming great and reaching your full potential and innovating every day mm -hmm. it, well, and, and, and one more thing sorry and if your boss or the person who hired you or the general manager or the the owner of the hotel is saying don't ever do that again i mean how unempowering is this? How on earth do you expect that your team is going to perform when there is, when you have fear in the building? Right. You, the best thing you can do is make your team feel fearless. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you, you can't go and say, well, that didn't work. Let's try something else, right? Yeah. Well, let's not do that again. That's <laughs> anyway, how you do it. It's a much different, it's the same message, but a much different way of, how you approach it and how you present it. And uh, you know, for that revenue manager, hopefully you've got some historic data. You know, we talked about looking at all of the mm -hmm. comps set and all the hotels in the area. Who cares what they're doing? What does your data show you? If yeah. you've got some historic data, that's going to be more intelligent for you than what the guy across the street is doing, unless you're a new build hotel. Okay, so you're a new build. But if you, even if you're a new build, surely the people building and owning your hotel have done some market research and have some expectations about where you ought to be in 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 that right so th there ought to be some foundations that you can work from there's only four right there's four scenarios that usually play into a market from a revenue manager's perspective either you are the market leader to your your segment of your product you have a peer that does what you do in equality of like you're both going back and forth as to what you each do mm -hmm. or you follow, which means whatever, whatever somebody else does, you pattern your performance metrics off of what they're doing to what you do. And then there's this amazing mix that's only happened once that I've ever personally experienced where everybody in the market is their own leader. And each property reflects its current unique value that each revenue person has designated their rates, not in comparison and reflection to anything in their market, but to what they are in their own market, what their product represents themselves to be. Only once have I ever seen that rarefied unicorn air that had where everybody in that comp set was their own leader, their own rate strategist, their own method and process. And all that the star report reflected was the variations of people wrestling between which position they were rolling between, depending upon the demand of market. Did their salespeople do good on their group sales? You could see it in their rate strategy. Did their people do well on their group, their, their blocks and search? You could see it in the race. And everybody did their own thing, not because of what everybody else did, but in spite of what everybody else did, because they were doing it according to what their business was. It was really amazing when were, that was. Were they all independent? What market? Huh? 
What market was it? Oh, it was in New York. It was in New York, Adele. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah it was in New York. <laughs> but it was it's just, independent. Huh? Brand it was a mix, independent. but it, uh, there was one brand hotel in it, but everybody else was independent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the independents can get away with that a little bit better than what the brands can. Yes. But the brand, because because they were they were in the, the, the market because of what they offered because of the common space and their, their block of room. Holy jeez, who the hell is that? We got half. Hey. Well, hey, you just tell us, Dean. When when did the uh, host of the show get replaced with Steven Seagal? So um. that oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, that went to yeah. Uh, I'm trying to keep my good side because I went to the dermatologist, so I'm like over like this, like yeah, I don't like the bandaid doesn't stay on and it looks dorky anyway, so I got to go like this a lot. Well, how the heck yeah. is the one? Oh, dude! Yeah, great. Talk about Myrtle Beach for Memorial Day. Yeah, wow, it's, it's booming. We just, um, I'm in my beach attire. We just, we did a uh, Facebook Live video with Neutrogena this morning. Today is National um, Sunscreen Day, also known as Fry Day. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> so we we did a, a video with them this morning. But Myrtle Beach is hopping, man, and, and it really has been. So for those of you who don't know, I, I've Jump ship to the dark side. Now I'm on the DMO s- side of things. And oh, uh, that's not the dark side. It's yeah, like Darth Vader. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's we we've we've had a record spring. I mean, it's it, we were very early. If you remember last year, we were one of the first destinations to open back before last year's Memorial Day, and we did a lot of protocols in place to to make sure folks could travel safely and and do the right things. And we really didn't have a bad last year. It was pretty solid. We were leading the nation um, until really, until Orlando came back online with their parks is when we dropped to number two, but we've remained number two steadily throughout. Mm. And so I think we're on a lot of lists. We're one of the top flight destinations and which is new for us. And because we've just had Southwest come in uh, with 10 new direct flights and all the other airlines, we've now got nine carriers and they've all expanded their their routes. And then, uh, uh, AAA announced that we were the, I think the second um, most popular drive destination this Memorial Day weekend as well. So it's wow, it's busy. I can't wait to go visit. I know, right? Yeah, you're yeah, just around the block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to come definitely. up. I'm yeah. definitely going. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I, I I am so optimistic of the world of CVBs and 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 TDCs now with you in there because if anybody could talk about control influencing the demand markets contribution to the industry mm-hmm. you were like the poster child of that happening <laughs> i mean seriously i don't know about that but we are on a mission to make a little dent in the dmo space so people better watch out because we, we're not going to do things the way that folks have been doing it i mean there's a lot of great people doing great things for sure but we we are thinking of model beach more than a destination it is a brand and, and we want to figure out ways that we can um capture the minds, the hearts, and the dreams of everyone. And um, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the last uh, few weeks, I started about three weeks ago, I've been looking at a lot of the data of the demographics that come here. And I, I've had a little bit of visibility into that with some of my clients, but now I've got more data to look at. And so we were looking at the the, the demographic breakdowns of folks that visit Model Beach. And, and so We were looking at ethnicity, age, household income, a bunch of different dimensions. And then we started comparing it to other things that we knew. So one of the really fascinating things is if you look at the demographics of who come here and compare it to the United States as a nation, it's almost identical. We're really appealing to everyone. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things about the Grand Strand, the Myrtle Beach areas with 14 different communities, that all have a little bit of a different flair and, and a different appeal. You've got the you know downstairs, downtown boardwalk area that's you know vibrant and lively and exciting, and um, but then you've got like the sleepy towns like Paulie's Island and the in, inland charming towns like Conway. So we've got like a lot of different things going on. Eighteen hundred restaurants. I mean, there's a lot of food. Wow. There's a lot of attractions. There's sixty miles of wide open beaches, and it's. Um, we're appealing to everyone, and, and our new brand was just launched like a week after I started. So we are trying to con- get everyone to com- refer to us as the beach because that's the people that come here. They go to the beach, and um, 
we're, we're telling everyone that you all belong at the beach and we will welcome you when you're ready to travel. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm very excited. Okay, I'm fascinated by some of the new metrics that you have because now you're dealing with people t giving feedback like, well, I want Wi-Fi at the beach and I want interactive directories and guides and I don't want to miss the biggest ball of twine and all this other stuff. You got so much more to think about now than what you had before. It's, How do you organize all that? Well, I'm a long-term thinker. I'm a cathedral planner, right? I, I know that. This is not something I can jump in and just start implementing tactics and get to where I want. So, so spending a lot of time right now with our partners and, you know, internal and external and in trying to plan out the next three years, it's three year plan that I'm working on, but there's four core strategic priorities for me. One, one is, um, and it, it, it lines with, uh, Tim Peters, saying about content is king, customer experience is queen, and data is the crown jewels. So one, one of them is, uh, which is what you're asking about, is the, the consumer data side, like the behavioral side of things. Um, we have so many touch points, you know, from phone and visitor guide requests in our, our website. And we, using Flip2, can see folks flow through to our partners, to the hotel's websites, and to book as well. So we, we're able to see we're very unique in, in that we can see the full travel journey. And so um, we're going to, we're going to be figuring out ways that we can build the most, you know, in the right ways with privacy, with permission base, but we're going to build the most robust database of consumer behavior, demographics and psychographics and all that stuff that anyone's ever seen. And we're going to be able to leverage that in, in very smart ways. So that's, that's one of the strategic priorities. Content is another one really doubling down on how do we create the best internet experience for people to make decisions so that they can choose which of the 14 communities really makes sense for them. Uh, but also really leaning into user generated content too and letting that inform us and become a part of our marketing. We believe that, you know, the advocacy stuff that flip two does and those photos should become um, the cornerstone of our messaging in the future so that we're not showing models and people that look like they may come to model beach we're actually going to be showing real people that come to model beach and use them as the cornerstone for our content but we're going to blow up the content the other side of data is we're going to get really sophisticated in tracking performance of all the dollars we spend every penny our goal is to be able to track every penny how it performs and then the fourth strategic priority is the um the quality of the product so I'm going to be investing a lot in education in the marketplace, um, figuring out ways that we can elevate the, the quality of the product, the level of customer service and all that stuff. So it, it's like I said, it's going to be a three year plan. It's going to take a lot of effort from a lot so, of companies, but we're excited. Maybe because it's just fresh in my mind, having watched the representation of a local CVB, and we're not going to refer to it in Florida for just purposes of not being bashing because it already Dean's worried that I went over and bashed somebody else already. I was listening. Um, <laughs> hey, um, and I didn't, I love the dude. I just, anyway, um, your change in what you just said mm -hmm. is absolutely the antithesis of what I think most people see CVBs are right now, because it's like, well, whoever gets into the chair guiding that particular CVB or PDC, their agenda, almost politi politically mm -hmm. and the political perspective is these are our goals. These are our initiatives. It, it changes to the mode of the person that's sitting in the chair. And you have literally said, nope, not really. We're gonna let what we get as data on these core criteria dictate what our plan strategy is. Mm -hmm. We're not here because I think this needs to be done. I'm not, we're not gonna do this because we as a committee to appease political variations have decided this is gonna be done. We're gonna say, look, we're gonna trust in what we're getting from the people that are wanting and using our product to determine what it is we're going to be providing and making sure that we maintain the standards that they're expecting. Yep. I mean, in a nutshell, you just went over and said, we're going to do it completely different. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think you really realize how fundamentally different you're approaching this project compared to what I normally see people for all the times I've had to sit down with CVBs and TDCs pleading that literally, and I mean this, it, I was appeasing their personalities to mm -hmm. get into their agenda. I know that sounds terrible. I, I have no reality. agenda other than I want Model Beach to be the destination that everyone chooses to come to vacation and that the locals here have an amazing quality of life that is fostered by tourism. That's it. 
That, that's my intent. It's not personal. I have no side priorities. That's it. And so I'm just, I want to influence the fact that I think you need to take Adele and make her your spokesman. I think having her with her microphone <laughs> and doing the whole thing and then being the beat. I just, I'm just throwing in a first vote. <laughs> I think Adele should be, you know, hi, welcome to Myrtle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she would do great. She would do great. But we didn't come here to talk about Model Beach. We came oh, yes, we did. Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> if not, it's about Slow Dean, and Dean doesn't like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, um, but it, it's great to see you, to be honest with you. And I mean, it's always great to have Adele and Dean, too, but it's also nice that you come back from the fact that last I remember talking with you, it was like, I'm underwater. I'll let you know when I'm breathing again. <laughs> yeah, I'm breathing a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's like there's the occasional glug in there as I as my head goes under, but <laughs> I'm increasingly buoyant. So, yeah. yeah. It is good to hear what's going on in Myrtle Beach in places like that, because I mean, we, we've certainly seen good things about it in the industry news and stuff like that. But yeah. being able to hear from somebody at the source and you know, it just helps to kind of have an indicator of, hey, what else is going on out there in the world? Uh, where, where are their opportunities? Yeah, I think I've spoken with a handful of beach destinations, you know, Daytona, Panama City, other others that are kind of similar makeup to Melbourne Beach, although obviously not nearly as good. But they um, they they're having similar success. You know, we we are breaking almost every record on ADR and and uh, occupancy, and it, it's it's strong. And the important thing is it's being done safely. You know, the numbers aren't going up. The people that are traveling are being responsible. The, there's not a lot of negativity coming out of out of the travel so like we said since the beginning responsible travel is safe you just got to take care of yourself and as we increase the number of vaccinations which we as a state are getting close to that 70 percent mark it, it's it's only onwards and upwards from here so it may not be the the beginning of the end but it certainly as churchill said the end of the beginning we're very optimistic about the rest of this year well, it's good that you're doing it safely. I like to hear that because the, you know the the one thing that can go really bad for you is if you have a busy Memorial Day weekend and it ends up being on the news like a spring break down in Fort Lauderdale or whatever, where yeah. everybody got COVID and all crap. You know. Yeah, so, I don't yeah, think that's we're, we're going to probably have some scrutiny because it's it's big. We have a big bike festival over Memorial Day and we have a lot of families coming too. So it's it's about as busy as it gets here, yeah. right up there with like Fourth of July. Um, but we, we had the dry run last year, and that was a little chaotic. And, it, you know, mm -hmm. although a lot of people probably act in a little um, more cavalier than they should, that there wasn't a big fallout. You know, the numbers yeah. didn't really spike like they could have this time last year. But, um, no, I'm very confident in the, in, through this year. I think my, my eye is beginning to turn towards next year because we are faced with the same challenge that I think a lot of destinations are, which is the worker shortage. And... Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, it definitely impacts the quality of service. You know, you're having to wait longer at restaurants. A lot of restaurants are now beginning to limit the, the tables because it's the right thing to do, right? It, it's better to leave money on the table and, and service the people that you can service appropriately than to disappoint everyone. So we're, we're having that worker shortage issue, which is creating a potential service issue which is potentially affecting some experiences right people maybe aren't as happy as they would and we're in that that ever changing kind of battle between guest expectations and guest experience and we all know that if they're aligned or if the expectations are slightly below the experience we're in a good place and word of mouth is going to spread and you're going to continue to see repeat business but when expectations are go up at the same time that the experience goes down and there's a gap between those two, that's when you have a problem. And, and so right now expectations are through the roof because people have been locked up. This, they have a little more disposable income in general and, and they're spending a little more. So they think they're going on a vacation of a lifetime and then they're getting there and then having to wait a little bit longer to check in and wait a little bit longer to find a restaurant and, ch and eat and, and stuff. So, we have a little bit of this going on uh, across the country, right? Not singling out anywhere. And um, does that have an impact long term on travel to to those destinations? It might. Mm -hmm. So I think we're we're a little cautious about how do we tackle that. So we've got a lot of campaigns running about pack your patients. We're in, engaging and educating the consumer to let them know, hey, when you get here, it's not the normal 
expectations. It's you got to you got to set appropriately. You're going to wait longer, and it's okay. We've all gone through a lot. Everyone's doing the best they can, but we would really appreciate your help by just being a little more patient and tolerant and friendly with the staff because that, did that's you good for everyone. Did you hear about the Gig Pro app? No, what is that? Apparently, it's an app where you can go to and no matter, let's say you're a server and you can just see who needs, who has openings for gig work and okay. you can go and do a shift and get paid and that's it. And then work in another hotel or restaurant the next day. How cool and is that? It's called Gig Pro and it was created in Charleston, but it's been getting national attention. Hmm. Well, here's an idea. Everyone can come vacation in Model Beach for the summer and they just do Gig Pro to get <laughs> jobs to go out the summer and, and we'll be good. But you, you touch on something interesting, Adele. Like I, I think in my mind, everyone's focused on COVID being the cause for the worker shortage. And I don't think it is. I think I think it's an accelerator of what was already happening, because if you remember prior to COVID, we were talking at every conference about the worker shortage. It wasn't a COVID created thing. It was an industry wide. There were over a million job openings in the hospitality industry back in 2019. So I, I think we're seeing for the, some of the things you talked about earlier on the show about how staff are treated. Um, the appeal of the hospitality industry isn't there like it used to be there. It, the, people don't look at this as a, a lifelong career where they can have you know, upward mobility in and, and that coupled with coupled with um, the onset of the gig economy, so people can put food on their table really easily, right, through Uber and other gig gig opportunities. So if you just need to get a paycheck, you can you have flexibility to do that. You also have a very the younger generation is very very entrepreneurial. They've been brought up digitally native. They have access to all the knowledge. You can literally learn anything you want at any time on YouTube. You have access to marketplaces that you didn't. So you, any single individual can create a business within a day and start making money. And the younger folks would rather take that risk than invest in a potential career in hospitality. So I think we have a potential crisis on our hands in the hospitality industry long term, unless we figure out a, a, a way to create the workforce um, to, to see the value in, in giving back in hospitality and serving and, and making a good career. We have to invest in long-term strategies that encourage more folks to come into hospitality. Otherwise, my fear is this is not a, a gap that's gonna go away just because J-1 visas come over. This, this could be a sea change that we're seeing right now unless we do something about it. No, I agree with you. And, and, and yeah, you're right. It's probably just amplified or accelerated to your point, yeah. the, the, right. the issues that we had. And just as you're talking, I'm listening and, and I'm thinking about the massive decisions, whether you willfully or knowledgeably made these choices or not, but what you did in your decision process to make them less of an issue. I, I say that in reflection of where, uh, as obviously travel has become more of an interest and more of a hot button for news features, uh, more and more CVB and TDC people are getting interviewed on camera for stuff like, hey, what are you guys doing on XYZ and XYZ? And, to hear them answer compared to what, how you just answered and just I'm, I'm mentally putting comparisons together. It's like, you know, you're basing it on data decisions. Hey, look, and and then, and you know, you can argue the point was like, well, is your data skewed because you're only looking at the data of people that have already used your product and therefore you're only looking at the people that are most interested, but you're not, you're saying going forward, let's look at what we're doing, but let's do it right and make our decisions based on what we know about what people are, are coming to for. The, just as fundamental as like, okay, you could have polarized immediately in your role. This is we're going to be only for maskers. You know, we're Damon, we're going to we're going to really highlight the fact that we're totally safe and we're doing every we're putting protocols in. We're telling everybody we're putting signs up to wear masks and we're not wanting anybody here that doesn't isn't vaccinated. We're going to do you know all this stuff. You didn't. You didn't go over and say we're going to create this division. Inherently, well, a lot of us create, continue that polarization by how we respond to the other people that don't agree with us. We're just as bad as the people we're disagreeing with mm -hmm. by keeping that polarization. You're simply saying, look, let's look at the commonalities of what everybody enjoys coming to us. Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. And, and it's part of our DNA. I don't know if you know this or not, but Myrtle Beach isn't that old a city. It, the, the first resort was built here in the 1920s. 
and it was originally we were originally called Newtown, and then we became uh, you know a, a place where some of the the um, cotton mill would, would would bring their their team for the summer. You know, they they built housing and things like that for that. But the first big resort was built. Uh, it was called the Ocean Forest Hotel, and it was built because it was right smack in the middle of Miami and New York. So hmm. we're halfway between Miami and New York, and so all these people were traveling backwards and forwards and they felt like this would be a good spot on the, on the beautiful Atlantic ocean. To, to, so we were a melting pot of just different kinds of people from the rich and famous to just nomads and wanderers and dreamers and artists. And, um, we still that the, the local makeup, no one's been here for generation after generation because we haven't been around that long, you know? So the majority of people here are transplants. Like, I mean, obviously I'm not from Myrtle beach. I've been here for 20 years, but, most people are in my situation. They they came and visited here and fell in love with it and came here. And because of that, we have an eclectic group of people, an eclectic group of 14 communities. And, and our new brand is really leaning into that. We we want everyone to find their place in Myrtle Beach. We want everyone to feel like they have a place they belong in Myrtle Beach. All we ask is that you come and you respect the rules and you follow the law and that you're respectful to the community and you spend a little money while you're here that's it you know and everyone is welcome and so it, it's it's a really fun message to be putting out at a time when everyone else is trying to pull us apart so we're really exploring how can we use this narrative this storytelling um in our marketing in new mediums you know we're exploring podcasts and webisodes and pbs shows and amazon prime shows and all this stuff that is going to be focused on the fact that we're all different you're all different, but we can all come together and find a place we belong. And it's it's a really, uh, you can probably tell I'm very passionate about the message. I'm sorry. No, not at all. No, <laughs> very, very, very subdued, um, very passionate. I love everyone. Leave it. Who I am, and, and, and Mel <laughs> is very much that. So, yeah. do do you do you see uh, when, now that you're sitting there where you are doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Do you see places that you either you want to emulate or feel that they that you are respecting for what they've done like nashville nashville i i go back enough that i remember nashville was a sleepy little secondary market that uh had some growth space to it uh, but mainly was eclectically related to uh its downtown and the bar scene and stuff like this and now nashville is a powerhouse when it comes to destination is, right? conferences and so forth and not that you guys want to be that but i'm just yeah. saying do you look at places like that going, you know, what was I, their mod modality? I think or? I'd be foolish not to at least keep an eye on what other people are doing, right? Because you can get inspiration from that. But And you can learn from people's mistakes. Like I would argue that, yes, Nashville has created a powerhouse destination, right? And it's a lot of fun to go there. But, you know, to quote Tim, when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. They have a few shipwrecks. You know, it's oh, yeah. It's oh, yeah. It's the go-to place for bachelor and bachelorette parties. And if you go down there any evening of any day of the week, I mean, it's like Bourbon Street, you know, on steroids. It, yep. It's crazy um, going from, you know, the honky-tonk, the honky-tonk bars. It's 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 a lot of fun, but it I wouldn't want to take my kids there now, you know. So yeah. I think there's – there's lessons to be learned and, and things to watch, but I, I've always been someone that, you know, I like the Amazon approach where you can kind of keep an eye, a little bit of an eye on the competition, but if you're focused on your strategy and you believe 100% in your strategy, it doesn't really matter what everyone else does. It's similar to what Dean was saying earlier about rates. Don't worry so much about what the other guy's doing with rates. Just make sure your rates are in line with your demand and your quality of product and your experience, and you'll do fine. But it's when you start focusing too much on the competition is is when you have those zero sum games race to the bottom because they rate lowered their rate. I know I need to lower my rate, and I need it. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm not too worried about the competition because I really, I mean, I don't think we really have competition in terms of the assets that we have. We have, eight, like I said, 1,800 restaurants, 60 miles of beautiful beaches, 14 very unique communities. It's there's nothing else can you know, we're in this Goldilocks zone between where for ninety percent of the year the weather is beautiful. You know, it gets a little cool in, in December, but hey, we're gonna turn that around and turn it into a, a holiday destination, you know. So it it's really the Goldilocks zone. Um I, I've lucked out landing here. Um mm -hmm. but yeah, it, 
it's, it's cool. <laughs> well, I would say it's a little warm in the latter part of summer for golf too. Just just having yeah. had how long I had to market from land, that market. It's perfect golf weather. So it's, yeah. it's great. <laughs> and you know what? In the summer when it's ninety degrees, we have uh, over fifty putt putt courses. You know, mini golf courses. So you can go do that and drink a beer. So there's there's options for everyone. Spoken like a true representation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, is what is it like? How is it different uh, dealing with all the uh, condominium owners, that kind yeah. of uh, vacation rental kind of thing, instead of as many hotels as most destinations might have? Well, I, I think we're very fortunate in that we have a lot of variety of of, op, of lodging options, right? And, and depending on where you are in the 60 miles, it's it's it can be very different. Like if you go to the extremes, it's almost all vacation homes, you know, and, and, and duplexes and things like that. So if you have a family, multi-generation family, and you need four or five or 10 bedrooms, we have that inventory. Or if you're in downtown Mother Beach, you've got true hotels, you know, four, 400 unit true hotels. Uh, next Next to large condominiumized resorts. So if you want a kitchen in separate bedrooms and you know you want the suites, we have that. But if you just want a standard hotel room, we have that too. So it, it's a real mix. I think one of the things we've done, which um, probably a little better than other destinations, is the, the on property management companies have done a good job maintaining inventory. You know, you, you look at other areas like maybe Panama City Beach, and you would have a resort that's 300 units and there's probably 30 or 40 different companies renting out units from there. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what that happens over time, but it's never good for the consumer because the average consumer that doesn't understand hospitality has no idea that I'm, I'm booking a hotel room at this hotel. I expect it to all be the same. You know, we've trained them that brand standards are a thing. So when you go there two years in a row and you've just happened to have booked through two different management companies and one room was up to date and had great luxuries, had access to the amenities and then the next you don't get access to the swimming pool and, and it hasn't been updated in 10 years but then you go to TripAdvisor and who do you blame you blame the resort because TripAdvisor does a garbage job of differentiating between on-site and off-site so it, it's you know it's a challenge every destination has but I feel like because of the quality of our management companies here we've defended against it a lot it's something we need to continue to defend against um, but you know, for the consumer, they have choice of product. You know, we've even got Airbnb and VRBO is fairly strong here. And so really, you again, depending on who you are and what you're looking for, you can find it in Mobile Beach. So, you know, now Google has taken vacation rentals and, and those types of lodging accommodations, and they're mixing them in with the search results for accommodations in Myrtle Beach, for example. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at that for Myrtle Beach. I, I tested in a few other areas. And uh, it, it still tends to, from what I've seen at least, tends to be dominated by hotels that they yeah. sprinkle in a couple of those lodgings. What I'm curious to see though, a lot of those vacation rentals uh, are a single point of sale model, meaning it's, it's not a meta search. I don't have multiple aggregated points of sale coming up on the Google display. It's usually uh, TripAdvisor is a big one. Yeah. Uh, Holiday Letting was another one I saw. VRBO used to be in there, but they kind of pulled out a little bit. Um, and so I'm kind of curious to see number one of Google evolves that into more of a meta search experience for vacation rentals. But yeah. also curious too with vacation, one of the things I found with vacation rentals, and part of the reason that I think Google likes them in that space is with a lot of your OTAs, the big brands out there have negotiated lower commissions, right? Sometimes as low as the low teens, right? Vacation rental commissions, a lot of those are still over 20%. Mm -hmm. That's a game changer. So now all of a sudden, oh, hey, there's some money in there. And I think that's why Google is doing this, not because they're getting paid 20 percent, but because the people who are getting paid 20 percent will pay CPC to be in there. Yeah. And, and think about it like the, the the margins on vacation rentals can be a lot higher because if you're if you're renting a five or six bedroom vacation home, you know, it's mm -hmm. the, the ADR is pretty high on that. So, yeah, yeah there, there, there's some money to be made. But, you know, I think I think any for any destination to be successful, you've got to have. Um, diversity of, of inventory, you know, because yeah, not everyone wants that experience. They don't want the that, they, and they don't maybe don't have the, the resources for that. But some people just want a little box room to lay their head so they can come to a, a 
music festival, whatever it is, you know? So I think yeah. you've got to offer a variety of... And, and let's not forget fact that there's a, a, a diversification as to the means of travel too. RVs now, oh my gosh, you know, the demand of what people have, for all the people that have bought RVs and or looking at that this is their means of travel now because they don't want to be dealing with the other components of travel that they are not uh, wanting to enjoy anymore. Yeah. RVs is a whole big thing now. Now, how, if it lasts, you know. Uh, no, I think but, it was a trend before COVID, but it's another situation where COVID has accelerated, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's I becoming more own. popular as a, as a means of, of vacationing. I, I learned something interesting, and I haven't verified that this is factual, but someone told me, so I'm going to pretend like it's a fact. You know, bloke down the pub said you know, it it's, must be true. Um, but when Disney Pixar, when they were forming the ideas for Toy Story uh, 4, uh, they struck a deal with Go RV and Go RV asked them to incorporate RVing into the storyline, which obviously they did. If anyone's seen yeah. Toy Story 4, so those kind of promotions um, are really interesting to me as a destination marketer or someone that is trying to find ways to put my product, my brand into you know the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. um, that, those kind of collaborations are really, really interesting to me. That someone like Go RV would say, "Hey, if we can get RVing into a children's." movie that's going to be really popular it's going to influence kids and, and adults to want to go rving more so sure. it's kind of cool from a marketing perspective Again, yeah the macro it, it sounds yeah. really cool so I'm hey speaking from a technology side this is our second episode that we're uh, summercast live on hospitalitychannel.tv and this is the first live broadcast on talktravel.tv which is the uh, app that's going out to roku Apple Plus, Apple TV, or Go, Google Play, and um, Amazon, Firestick. All right. So, so I, I have no idea what either of those are other than streaming <laughs> services. Well, they're, 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 they're platforms. They're, and this is the part that I think probably you're going to be probably exposed to a lot. OTT channels now are going to be a thing. I mean, not just the OTT and advertising, but OTT right? channels. Low barrier yeah. entry. Yep. Yeah, because, uh, well, it, it's still a bit of a challenge, but because you have to still get the apps made on each of the platforms, they still have to get approved. You have to go through all that process. But you also have to have it on a subscription model where you people have to pay to get access to your channel. I mean, you can give it away, uh, but you're still paying everybody else to run it for you. It's, it's not like, you know, it, it, uh, everybody has their hand out in the food chain. Um, but just like Netflix, where you go on a Roku uh, stick or Roku TV and you're like, oh, I want Netflix. Well, you pay for a subscription to have Netflix as a channel. That's what we have now. We can actually have a channel. And the platform is cool because I can do the recorded replays on three levels, linear, looped, or uh, on demand. And you have codes for us to get it for free? And, and yes, I will give you a free code. Not everybody, <laughs> sorry. Because <laughs> everybody that signs up, Cost money, uh, <laughs> but the idea of it is, is like for things now. I'm looking forward to like that whole Dallas discovery. You know, I think you might not even be able to make it, Stuart, because you're going to be probably doing a different conference other than high tech this year. Um, um, I think I'm I'm coming to the HSMAI Digital Strategy Conference. Probably not okay. all high tech. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. But uh, I'm I'm going to be talking to Julie soon about the fact that with this channel, it's actually a TV channel. We can do live broadcast because like right now it's being live broadcast on the channel. If you go to those places, it's actually broadcasting now. So uh, don't question, if I'm a consumer, how do I find this content? Right now, those two platforms, uh, hospitalitychannel.tv is playing it. And then uh, if you go to um, talktravel.tv, the final I process of those websites is not available somewhere else. Or right now, Roku, everything's in final version queue. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. went through the last hoop of all this, and now I'm waiting for the platforms. They say within two to three days, they'll go live on there for subscription. So, so if I load my Roku app and I just search for Hol Give me three days. It'll be on Roku in three days. Yeah. Memorial Day. <laughs> yeah, Memorial Day. It'll be my Memorial Day. Um, we know what Lauren's doing with his weekend. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Actually, it's been a, a, a pretty interesting path because you think you're comfortable with what you know is the technology until you're hit with walls of Apple saying, oh, I'm sorry, we need your Dunn's number. Am I what? My Dunn's number. I have a Dunn's number? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I got to go find a Dunn's number because I got to change from a developer's license to an organizational license. Why? I don't know because that's what I need. Um, you know, Roku coming back saying, I'm sorry, but your pixel count on your icon for your app is two pixels farther than we need. We need to read, and okay, and I got to go back in and change, you know, it's that 
like, okay, I didn't know about all these pieces. But yes, all four platforms are going to be launched, they say, within three days. Uh, so why are the um, different brands? Well, they're all four. They're all four medium channels. I mean, Apple TV for those who have Apple TV. For those who use Google Play to watch stuff, it's on Google. Amazon Fire Sticks, and and, and these are all apps. hospitality TV. Hospitality and, Channel TV. Actually, it's called Hospitality TV. Is okay. actually the. And then what was channel. the other one? Though? There was there was two that you'd said. Oh, those two. Okay, two websites. There's two websites that they're running on. One is HospitalityChannel.tv. Yeah. The other one is talktravel.tv. So what's the difference between those? Okay, hospitalitychannel.tv is going to be uh, linear free programming. Basically replays of our live show podcasts and other things. And you're going to also can old legacy content from the last legacy days. content. Okay. The talktravel.tv is what will be on Roku, Amazon, Google and um, whatever one I missed. Uh, I was on Google, Apple. Um, that's the subscription service that uh, right now the price is four ninety nine, four dollars ninety nine cents a month to subscribe. On that will be unique content that is worthy of people paying for. Okay. You know, Dean does a presentation on Meta Search. Yeah, blah, 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 that content, what type of content? It's going to be live coverage of, of events like HSMAI. It's going to be uh, presentations of actual content that's usable, functional, not just rehashing of anything old or new or free and that's what the content will be on that will be changed every week that's the stuff that comes from the hospitality marketing club it comes from all the stuff that we have from presentations and training of all a specific hospitality hence hospitality tv um content that people are saying i'll pay five bucks a month to see this stuff that's what and it's, it's all on be. demand stuff it's all in demand it's all in demand there'll be different episodes on it that you can say i want to watch about how to create localized geo-targeted campaign stuff oh that'd be cool to know you know mm -hmm. or hey this is what meta search is great there's meta search and mm -hmm. that's what the content it sounds is. like a bargain for 4.99 a month you would think it would be but but wait, or do. and there's a it's a, right now i have it as a seven day free trial i'm thinking from basically consensus that i might up that is, um, there, is there um is there content out there already Right now, it's just I loaded the content of old shows just to have, be able to submit it for it to be launched. Okay. But as soon as it goes launched, then I'm going to replace the content. Um, I get 10 hours free with the platform I'm with, and then I pay $4 an hour for additional content beyond it. So it's kind of like carpet for the horse. Let me get it launched before I start incurring more expense to putting more content on. But I can put 10 hours of content on initially. The really cool part of it is, is that what I got to do with this platform compared to Vimeo is pushing the bejeebers out of offering this right now. Mm -hmm. They're pushing out this whole, get your own OTT channel. And they're pushing like, oh, you do fitness training? Oh, you want to do this? And it's kind of that, it, the purpose of what they're pushing it for is the fat, easy market right now of trainers, yoga instructors, uh, cooks that want to show how to cook. Because it's like literally, you know, you're creating your own channel that you can go over and say, oh, I'll pay to go over and learn how to make souffles. Okay, sure. You know, it's like your own little you know, food channel. Or I'll pay to watch this particular uh, workout instructor show me how to do workouts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the easy market to sell to right now. So I'm looking at being first to market and then adapting what the content is based on literally the demand of what people are wanting. Like, okay, this is what I think you want. But maybe you want something different. But the cool part is, like, when I go to the HSMAI for, or high tech or something, when I broadcast live now, it literally is broadcasting on a TV channel. People can watch it on TV if they're following the channel, which is pretty, in my mind, pretty cool. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, that'd be fun, you know. But these websites, the hospitalchannel.tv, that's, that's linear content. And I actually got that platform uh, because I, I was thinking for hotels. They can run their own channel now. They can do a linear channel that says at five o'clock we talk about dinner specials today in our restaurant, or they can have a loop channel that we're very familiar with with hotels, which is hi, welcome to Las Vegas, and here's all the cool stuff. And then there's also an on-demand one. Hey, local restaurant guide, click it, and it'll play whatever the con you know that content. So it, it's a pretty cool channel platform on its own too. That's cool. Uh, yeah, That's but cool. Uh, like I said, your technology stuff. Mm -hmm. How do I put my podcast on the channel? That's the thing you're going to do. That's the video stuff we got to do. We got to convert your audio to video, which is that platform I told you about. Yeah. But I have video because I. She oh, so then we we'll just put it on. We we'll just put in the linear stuff. Well, just I'll send me the if it's on a YouTube link, I can put the link directly in and it'll play it from it. Which is also another cool feature of that hospitality channel stuff is I don't need the actual content. I can just take the link of the content with permission and put it into the programming. And I literally, like a TV producer program, is saying, I want this to play at 2 o'clock. 
you know, Dean's hour of meta search, two o'clock on Tuesdays, don't miss it. And I can actually put Dean's stuff in at two o'clock and it'll play at that, at that time each day, that linear programming. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, as much fun as this has been, as much as I've missed you. Hey, I'm it's been great to see you. you know. Yeah, it was good to see you. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah. Five minutes left. No, you can't leave me. No, that's all good. <laughs> Hang on. Another five minutes, man. All right. I twist my arm. It's like one more beer. Yeah. So. <laughs> now, are, you, are you in your office, Mr. Star Wars, in the background? I am. This is my office. I have, I have some Star Wars there. I also have, let's see if this works without breaking something. I don't know, because my, um, my uh, camera's on my monitor. So uh, look at look at the oh, nice posters. Oh, yeah. I'm doing something similar to that. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's I've got a theme going. I found I want to put on the on this wall over here. I want to put a um another picture, and I found one, but it's a tad expensive. But it's um I'm a Beatles fan, and uh, the the classic uh, Abbey Road shot of the the four Beatles walking across this, the the zebra crossing the zebra crossing in the abbey road there's one of those called abbey rogue and it has uh, a stormtrooper darth vader palpatine and <laughs> with that walk gonna cross in the same pose and it's a really if you're a real nerdy beatles fan you would know that uh, on the album cover of abbey road um paul mccartney has no shoes on he's yeah, barefoot right Sorry. paul mccartney is dead <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> My kids are into that conspiracy too, um, but Palpatine is is in that third position, and he has no shoes on in the Abbey Road. Uh, show. It's really cool. but it's, it's a canvas. Uh, get everybody there. knows with Sgt. Pepper Price. album, the Guitar Flower uh, Memorial was a, a showing that Paul McCartney. You know, they cloned him, put him in another person. So you know, everybody knows that. Uh, <laughs> well, he, he, I, I saw him live, and unless he's a clone. Um, He's alive and kicking. He's he <laughs> not far from where I, I grew up. And you'd see his limo go through our village every now and again. Uh, it's another guy. It's a different guy. That's all right. And, and just for the record, even though this is a hospitality show, Omega and the Bad Batch, I think, is a Palpatine clone. But that's just me talking. <laughs> <laughs> She's definitely force sensitive. That, that's okay. The same. Um, with all of that. Yeah, well, um, gosh, we Robert, thank you for the list. We did hit a couple of items, which you should be happy that we did uh, on topics. But uh, as a reminder to everyone, there is an absolutely outstanding list that Robert Cole from Rock Cheetah does put together every week for us. He did get us a few minutes before the start of the show, so we do have, we did have that to be able to go to today. But if you would like to send up your own copy of it, it is free from him. You do go to bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash Rock Cheetah, all lowercase, no space. And it's a great, wonderful list that recaps the week very nicely. Um, also, as a reminder for everyone that we do the clubhouse, which uh, Stuart has not been able to attend as much because he is saving the world. I've been in one of them in the last three weeks, I think. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now there's actually two. There's there's two clubhouses to talk about. One is that Ed runs at 8 a.m., which Stuart used to be also co-running, but again, busy. Uh, 8 a.m., which is... Um, uh, what does it call it? Hospitality <laughs> coffee uh, talk? Coffee. Or, yeah. coffee. Hospitality, okay. Um, and he does it on Wednesdays with uh, mainly uh, focus on uh, uh, destination marketing. Yeah, I've been trying to pop in on the Wednesday one. It's, it's you know, in my wheelhouse now with my new. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we have it on at noon uh, for our conversation with his open dialogue. I've been kind of sure these past couple of days. Dean knows this is like, you know, uh, I, I try to emulate where we have more people participating with it, but it hasn't been working. So it's like once I'm done talking, it's like if we don't have anything more to talk about, you know, OK, we're done. Thanks. Bye. Um, but we've been doing that at noon and continue to do that new Monday through Thursdays on Clubhouse app. Um, and then, of course, they hear this show that is now broadcasted on TV. And we'll be three days from now on Roku, Google, Amazon, and Apple. So in that sense, it'll be fine, but I'll pay for it. Okay, so with that, we are at that point. Uh, real quick, um, podcast Adele and where to find you. The Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast. Get great reviews. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, Spotify, etc. And you can just uh, find the links on Adele Gutman at 
Yeah, AdeleGutman.com, but as simple as that. Um, you know what, Lauren, is my new podcast going to be up today? Because I had a wonderful conversation with the owner of the uh, Nantucket Hotel and Resort that for, I think, five years now, it's been either the number one, number two, or number three hotel in the United States of America wow. in guest reviews on TripAdvisor year after year and she ha is full of wisdom and great advice yes it will be it will be up today i, I was able to get the voiceovers <laughs> done last night so it will be up today <laughs> great i will keep up with my beautiful duties um and and sloan dean call me i can help you with that uh, <laughs> situation and uh and I, I would also love to help all the hotels and uh vacation rentals in myrtle beach get great reviews I guess I'm not going to have more barbecue with Sloan Dean when I get back to Dallas. I don't know. I actually, again, Sloan's a great guy. Just don't know where you are sometimes. All right. Mr. Dean, since I just love seeing your face when I mention people like that. You know. But anyway, Mr. Dean, if you want to know about what you are doing and where to find you in your podcast, where can they find you? You bet. So basecampmeta.com, metasearchmarketing.com. Uh, keep an eye out for it. Actually, in fact, I think it came out yesterday. The HSMAI Executive Insights newsletter came out, and we actually had an article in that. Uh, which I've shared on my Basecamp LinkedIn page, but I haven't shared it on my own just yet. Uh, I've got to spread that out a little bit. Uh, but it's on, it's of course on MetaSearch, but you know, when we talk about MetaSearch, everybody talks about Google. There's a whole world beyond Google. And so we said MetaSearch beyond Google. What else is out there looking at it by countries, by regions, by sites, different things like that. Great article, uh, which will be in there to help launch our educational series now that is being partnered with HSMAI. So exciting things going on with that. Uh, within our meta search marketing, particularly if you're one of those small properties out there, uh, even a vacation rental, there's some catches to vacation rentals when we talk about how to do meta search, but there are channels that are ideal for that. And uh, even if you're a small little bed and breakfast in Myrtle Beach that wants to have a point of sale on your Google My Business page, I can make that happen for you. Reach out to is me. Is he at coattailing you, Stuart? Is he coattailing you? Is that what's happening? <laughs> you bet I am. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we got to tell them Melissa's in the uh, the peanut gallery, fuel travel, great podcast, multi award winning, probably be better than it ever was before because Stuart's not there anymore. Melissa's it's running definitely the show. Us with points, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Stewart, hey, by the way, so are you still on the HSMI board? Is that are you still mm -hmm. are you able to yeah, yeah, with that? Time, so I have this year and next year to, to see how that term. Um, are you also on the content board for the, the marketing conference as well? Or? I'm not. No, I'm on the thought leadership um, work group. So. Okay, I know Melissa was on the last show. She was talking about the fact that they're they, they're having a very aggressive agenda growth on it, and I'm really looking forward to it. I really hope that I can make it out to Dallas to catch it and Rock and also High Tech. Um, but it, it looks like it's going to be a really neat emerging content. If Melissa's involved with the content and you're influencing it from what you're doing, I think it's going to be very relevant. I think it's going to be a very good yeah, conference. It's, great. it's one of my favorite for my content. They they really you know the good thing about it is. The content isn't put together by the, the show um, managers, right? It's put together by folks that are attendees because the marketing advisory board, ACSMI, is made up of hospitality professionals. And so they're the ones deciding on who who the speakers should be. So it really is a good um, representation of folks that we, we as the hospitality industry want to hear from. So that's mm -hmm. what feels great. That is the difference between HSMAI and any other organization that puts on a conference. It's it's hoteliers and hospitality people putting together content for ourselves, mm -hmm. and it makes such a difference. Yeah. Uh, I think you're confusing, though. I think it's Tammy. It miles. Was it Tammy that was in? Not Melissa. Yeah, you're right. Oh, you're right. It was Tammy. Thank you. Yes, yeah. you're right. It was Tammy, not Melissa. My bad. Thank you for correcting me on that. It <laughs> Tammy was Tammy. Carla. Tammy was doing that. You're absolutely she's right. Great. I hope she gets to speak again because she's spoken at the conference. Oh, before. she did great. She, she really great. did. Yeah, she did. She crushed it last time for a very complex topic, too. I think I gave her credit for that. It was that was like no easy topic to do in six Sometimes minutes. Sometimes people slip through the cracks. I remember this this clown was his name. Um, Lauren Gray at one point did a session. It was, you know, but eh, it's but old hey, news. He made yeah, up for it, too. That was the first place I ever met Dean. He did, he did a really good um, yeah. session <laughs> on myth busting meta which is posting your meta yeah yeah i i don't know for as much as i'm looking forward to the content of the of that event i'm probably going to be more interested in what are people doing in group hugs and connecting oh, and get the biggest people and 
ever that it will probably last a little too long and you'll feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> a little uncomfortable. But it's, it's like coming. a Joe Biden call. Like, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, we're both vaccinated. We can hug it out. Right. There it is. There it is. Hey, so Stuart, I get yeah. to ask for the first time in a long time. So people want to know more about Myrtle Beach. I got to call with a whole new spiel. This is I'm yeah, getting, it's like, a whole new spiel time. Get muscle memory and start saying, well, you should go listen to the the podcast at fueltravel.com slash podcast, regardless. <laughs> even though I'm not on it anymore, I'm on the first 185 episodes, but it's still continuing its stellar job of producing some amazing tactical advice for for hotels and Pete is taking on the mantle in, in Melissa and Phil is still running the mm-hmm. show as well. So it's continue to listen to that field travel.com slash podcast. But um, yeah, you can find me on clubhouse. Sometimes you can find me on LinkedIn at Stuart Butler, or if you want to learn about what we've got going on in Myrtle beach, uh, my new email address is Stuart.butler at visit beach.com. So you can uh, just shoot me an email. Love to hear from you, hear what's going on. And I miss all my hotel friends for sure. Yeah, it's good. It's really great to see you. And Adele and Dean, thank you so much as always for the privilege of everyone's time. Mm-hmm. Um, this and all episodes previous to this, all 302 prior to this, are mm-hmm. available at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com and now also available on hospitalitychannel.tv and in future tense, um, talktravel.tv. Wait, a minute, you are, Stuart, I went and went your way of saying make shorter better, talktravel.tv. What do you think? You know, it's kind of catchy. I, I'd forgotten it until you were. Re- um, referenced it but yeah it's, it's succinct which is good should be yeah kind of straightforward we'll see where it goes and it's an evolving thing i, I i'm starting with what you know as a, with all things you you make it your own idea but then when you put it out into the public it turns into whatever the public wants it for so it's okay. always it's listen to the consumer man no matter what job you're doing if you want to be a good marketer listen to the consumer and that's what we're hoping that evolves into as to what is it people want to get off of that channel so with all that also podcasts uh ones that we didn't mention today there's sales podcasts with holly zoba Hospitality Sales Podcast. Uh, we also have um, the reputation, uh, excuse me, not reputation, but the revenue management one with uh, Miss Lily Mockerman, who is enjoying her time in Mexico City, which, you know, that's why. Wait, well, what? Oh, yeah. Oh, she Lily's living her life in Mexico. That's a whole other episode. <laughs> yeah. She's down there for a whole month doing the whole digital nomad thing. Oh, wow. A whole, yeah, a whole month down there. Yeah, just follow her Facebook profile and you'd be like, yeah, you're having fun. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah, so she's she's there, but she is a podcast. I'm after the latest episode. I just got it loaded up, Adele. So that's why yours is getting loaded up today. Uh, her number, uh, the podcast number thirty-two, just uh, loaded up. Uh, and so, uh, but there's that podcast one. Plus, also I'll be re- recording the hospitality marketing podcast, which we'll have a little recap of today. And I'll talk about Dean there too. And no, <laughs> <that's Lindy. laughs> anyway. Thank you all for the time, uh, and we look forward to you joining us on Clubhouse next week at noon. Um, no, actually, Monday we're not doing it. It's Labor Day. Sorry. Tuesday next week. Memorial Day. Clubhouse. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Monday, no. Tuesday, yes. Um, but Friday next week, 11.30 a.m. Eastern always, and we'll simulcast this again. Uh, Sydney time and London time, Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. So thank you all, and appreciate Bye, it. Guys. Great to see you. Bye, Have everyone. Happy holiday. Bye. Happy Memorial Day. <laughs>